Well, good evening again. I'm Rosetta Clay, Assistant Vice President of Engagement, I, and I am so excited to welcome you to Illinois Wesleyan University's Homecoming 2020. Thank you all for joining us for the first Back to College class of the week. I know, I know, Beckman Auditorium looks a little different this year, right? No, but seriously, this is one for the record books in hosting the first ever virtual homecoming. And even though we're not together here on campus, and it's not how any of us plan to celebrate this year's homecoming, I'm absolutely certain you will find interesting and engagement, engaging events throughout the week that you will enjoy. Now, a few reminders of how the webinar will be conducted. Everyone is muted. However, you are encouraged to participate by using the chat function at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions or make comments. I will make every effort to get as many of those questions in as possible at the end of the presentation. Also, in case you have to leave early, or if you would like to share this webinar with others, it is being recorded and we will post it on our YouTube channel for future viewing. And now I'd like to ask Pres President Nugent if she will please introduce our distinguished speaker for the evening. Thank you, Rosetta. My pleasure. Uh, let me also welcome you to a uh, homecoming of a sort on a screen. And we do hope that you'll join us for the many different events that will be happening this week. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate our speaker tonight, Dr. Raymond Pete Davis, for being this year's 2020 uh, recipient of the Distinguished Alumnus Award. Congratulations, very well deserved. And now I will say a bit about why it's well deserved, Pete. <laughs> so <clears throat> Pete is a member of the graduating class of 1980. And I guess I haven't fully done my homework. I don't know if this is absolutely unique but I can imagine it's pretty darn unique. And that is that he was a triple major in physics, chemistry, and biology. And I also uh, have seen a comment from one of your classmates, Pete, that says, even given that, you were a pretty fun guy. So <laughs> that takes a lot. Um, after graduating from the university, Pete attended the University of Illinois College of Medicine and had his residency at St. Francis Medical Center. He is now a practicing pediatrician in Rockford, Illinois, board certified in pediatrics, and especially with an additional certification in child abuse pediatrics. And that's what he'll be talking with us about this evening. Since the early 90s, Dr. Pete has treated children who are victims of physical or sexual abuse. He's a founding member of what's called the Medical Evaluation Response Initiative Team, MERIT. And that's a part of the Illinois College of Medicine in Rockford. He is also a member of the faculty, uh, now an associate professor in pediatrics at UIC Rockford. And he serves as director for not one, but six county advocacy centers in Northern Illinois. Nationally, he is also a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Child Abuse and Neglect. Now, in addition to his medical practice, Dr. Davis is also an educator. He's developed a curriculum on physical and sexual abuse of children and mandated reporting. He provides continuing medical education on child abuse topics and seminars to the Department of Children and Family Services, to detectives, and to the state's attorneys in 15 counties. He has won numerous awards, including Excellence in Child Welfare Award from the Winnebago, Winnebago County CASA, that is Court Appointed Special Advocates for Children. The Winnebago County, uh, I'm sorry, the Illinois State Medical Society Alliance Humanitarian Award, recipient of that in 2016, and the Rockford Chamber of Commerce 20 People You Should Know Award in 2019. As I said this evening, he'll be speaking to us about his specialty. And I think we all know that the COVID pandemic has presented many, many challenges in our society. And certainly among them uh, has been an increase in domestic 
violence and probably in child abuse. And he'll be speaking to us about that. Um, this is obviously a very concerning situation of the many uh, issues that we're dealing with today. I do want to say that in addition to this specialized practice, Dr. Davis also maintains his regular pediatric process, practice. And he has said that just being able to see a kid who doesn't feel so well smile again is what keeps him going. So we're delighted to have him here. Dr. Davis. Thank you very much, President Nugent. Um, boy, and I thought I just got up and went to work every day. Um, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, I think she was gonna put up the first slide for Wesleyan, um, or am I just supposed to? Disabled, it said. Okay, can you, I guess, can you share yours, Dr. Davis? Yes, you can go ahead with your slides, Dr. Davis. Okay. Okay. All right, then. So, and can everybody see the slide? No. Yeah. Yes? Yes. Yes. Just the slide. Or is it two slides? Two slides. Two slides. Let's do this. How about that? Is that better? Now it's full screen. Now it's full screen. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and I, again, I really appreciate this is, I can't tell you how humbled I am um, that to be nominated, let alone to, to actually receive this award. It is something I never envisioned in, in I don't know how long ever. Um, I want to talk a bit about child abuse, a little bit about you know, why a child abuse pediatrician? You know, where did we come from? What's it all about? And, and, and it's probably a subspecialty of medicine that many people have probably or may have never heard about until today. You know, it's with child abuse, the, the thing to remember about that is basically it's the hidden nemesis. Um, it's out there, but nobody wants us to find it. At least the people who are aware of, of it, the people perpetrating the crimes, do not want it to come to the forefront, which makes it a unique area of medicine, makes it a little bit more difficult area of medicine. And without a doubt, the second quote is my favorite, being, you know, if you really don't think about it, and I kind of drum this into the med students' heads, yeah, you're gonna miss it frequently. So why? Why do we have child abuse pediatricians? <clears throat> well, first, a little background on the history of child abuse. It is nothing new. It's been around forever. If you look back to Egyptian paintings, um, stuff there, when they did their embalming, there are pictures of brains of infants that they were putting to rest that would show one side of the brain with the normal uh, brain tissue present, the, the little gyri and the invaginations, the other side being completely blacked out, which we presume was representation of a bleed, a subdural hemorrhage, one of the most common findings in child abuse. In the 1600s, there's numerous reports in England during those time periods with the royal family where the princes were frequently subjected to sexual abuse by their attendants that were females during that time. And then even in the 1800s, um, 1800s, it became more formalized. We finally had a French pathologist, Tardot, who received the first or gets the basically credit for Two, two things, one in 57, the first textbook on sexual abuse, the uh, assault on decency. And then in 1860, he also published uh, a report of children that have undergone tremendous physical abuse um, and described this thin layer of blood on the surface of their brain, basically linking the subdural hemorrhage or bleeding on the surface of the brain to child abuse injuries. Um, so where do we stand in the U.S.? How has child abuse and child protection come about in the U.S.? You know, until about 1875, or at least in the colonial times, um, there was no organized child protection. Um, and then it was shortly after that that we started to see the growth of protection organizations, some non-governmental sponsored societies from 75 through 60, 1962. And then it was really in 62 when we 
developed more of the, what I call the modern era, where we have go government-sponsored child protection. Um, so in 1875, um, there are a couple of things that occurred. In New York City, there was the development of what was called the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. It gets credit for being the first organization dedicated to protecting children, specifically children. Founders were a couple of lawyers by the name of Berg and Geary, and Geary was the first president. Um, in, by 1899, we actually had the first juvenile court appear. So, and that was in Chicago, Illinois. So one, one step up for Illinois. Um, that was the first court dedicated solely to injuries and the best interests of minors. Now at that time, there was no age cutoff limit. Um, and of course, by 1919, unfortunately, we had um, essentially all states, but three had juvenile courts. And then 1912, we saw the founding of the Federal Children's Bureau uh, was formed. Although a federal agency um, had very little funding, very little support, and it really did not do very much until the 60s, but it did have a very interesting uh, uh, impact on our child abuse as we know it today. So I'm sure you've all probably seen those commercials on TV, um, those animals that, you know, for 19.95 a day you, or a month, you can help stop all the cruelty that is going on. And I often have asked my, my bosses at U of I here, the dean and a few others, why don't we advertise for our program? We're always looking for grants like anybody else in medicine to fund projects, to fund our programs, to pay salaries. Um, child abuse doesn't pay um, financially, so it's always running in the red and we have to make up that end somewhere. So I suggested, why don't we do ads like that? Let's put those pictures out there of the kids we've taken care of and ask society to step up and help support these programs. Yeah, it's a good thing that I've got those filters because obviously that's not politically correct. And even if we had permission by the victims and their parents, um, I am sure it would be turned off as soon as the pictures hit the airwaves. But that's not anything new that we see animals being pled for and yet we don't hear much about children. That same group, Gary and Berg, that developed the NYSPCC in 1875, just a little side bit of information, two years earlier, 1873, also formed the New York Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. So once again, animals got a little more foot, footlight and a little more exposure than the human beings did. So that takes us up to about 62. When these two indiv individuals pretty much uh, changed the, the course of child protection services and child protection as we know it. Vincent de Francis was a lawyer. He was working with a federal program on abuse and Dr. Kempe, C. Henry Kempe, had just published what was called the battered child syndrome in 1962. Now this, every, if, if you're a physician out there, you know about quote landmark articles. And if you're a pediatrician, at least if you're older like I am, you probably know about this landmark article. But every so often those come out and this was one of them. And so what we saw was Dr. Kempe describing horrific fractures, bruises, other injuries in the so-called accident prone child. But in his paper, he brought up how many of these times it was repeated injuries and in situations where the uh, demographics of the family were very suspect in terms of uh, poverty levels, stress levels, um, also in terms of the amount of domestic violence, basically, the, the violence in the family. And his suggestion was that maybe we were missing something, and in fact, this is potentially what we used to call a, an accident-prone child, was really the victim of abuse. Well, catching on to that, the Federal Bureau's Children's Bureau, again, so started in 1915, now they convened a couple of meetings with De Vincent DeFrancis and Kempe and said, if that's the case, what do we do to prevent child abuse? And that came about our child protection laws. Their recommendation was that state legislation required physicians, at that time it was just physicians, to report suspicion of abuse to police or whatever state welfare agency that was there. So by 63, we had four states with child reporting laws enacted and by 67, all states pretty much had child reporting laws. And the government also responded in 62 as well. 
and said, well, if that's the case, then let's amend the Social Security Act of 35 to help provide funding for these welfare services. And then in 74, Congress passed the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act that authorized federal funds. Um, so that was about the time I started at Wesleyan and only four or five years prior to my getting involved in medicine. So I kind of pretty much grew up with the world of child abuse. Um, unfortunately, although government was taking some intervention all the way along, the medical response unfortunately wasn't so robust. Um, and, and there's a, a myriad of reasons too long to go into, but we can certainly discuss if anybody's ever interested. But it's interesting that even though we had mandated reporting laws and physicians had to report that, and of course, if we're dealing with children, that would most likely be a pediatrician, training in child abuse was not a required component of US residencies, pediatric residencies, until 1997. It was just assumed that somehow pediatricians would learn about this. Um, if we look at the area of sexual abuse, we are even farther behind in that, and in fact, most of our recent advances in sexual abuse haven't only came about in the last 15 to 20 years um, with some of the articles by some of the child abuse experts about how injuries occur with females and learning how to interpret the medical findings we were seeing. So the medical response has been pretty delayed. Um, and then on top of that, the American Board of Pediatrics was even more resistance on, on approving a formal certification for child abuse until about 2005 when they were finally convinced that the volume of knowledge and especially the requirement or the need to have formal training programs, some specialty fellowship programs to do research and education in this area to get a better grasp on child abuse, they finally gave in and, and, and acknowledged the fact that there would be a subspecialty. So it wasn't until 2009 that we actually had the first certifying exam for child abuse pediatrics. And then our program, as I said, as we know, started in 2008 with the U of I. So what are the numbers we see? What kind of statistics are there? Now, one thing you need to understand about child abuse statistics is they are nowhere, clear, nowhere close to accurate. We have numbers, we throw out numbers. You will see wide ranges when they talk about different studies. Um, and that's because, again, it goes back to what I said initially. We are trying to diagnose or bring to light something that the perpetrators and, and even other people involved may not want us to know about and may not want to bring to light. I have yet to have a parent bring their child into my office saying, I beat this kid up, can you document these bruises and turn me into DCFS? It doesn't happen. So today in Illinois, we will see roughly 222 reports of abuse and neglect just since one day. And about one in every 10 children in the state will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. And that's typical of a nationwide number as well. That comes to about almost 300,000 children in Illinois uh, before their 18th birthday, from the time of birth to their 18th birthday, will be sexually abused. If we look at the hotline reports, now DCFS gets a bad name. They get, you know, we make reports to the hotline in Illinois, DCFS, and there still is this, this preconceived idea that once a report is made, DCFS swoops in, takes kid out of there, and you never see the children again. And that's not exactly accurate. The true statistics are that we, they get about 255,000 calls every year to the hotline, to the DCFS hotline, but only about 30 to 40 percent of those are actually investigated in terms of allegations for possible abuse or neglect. And of those investigations, anywhere from 25, uh, a quarter to a third of them are indicated for abuse or neglect. So it isn't every child. Um, it isn't a perfect situation either. There are many cases where child abuse experts like myself or others running other programs don't always agree with the findings by DCFS one way or the other. On a statewide level, you can see over the last five years, What's really interesting is you see that we have increased from 110,000 investigations in 2015 to 143,000 investigations last year um, in the fiscal year 2019. Um, and so that, that kind of is an alarming increase, 
Um, if you go back and look at statistics prior to 2015, you will see that those numbers had run consistently between 102, 3,000 to 110,000 for the prior 15 years. So it's only been recently that we've seen an increase in the reports. Um, I don't know if that truly represents an, an increase in child abuse. It more likely represents um, an increase in the fact of our awareness of abuse and that we're doing a better job at making those reports and getting those cases uh, investigated. And then you can also see the indicator reports. So when DCF gets a report, they evaluate the situation and within 30 to 60 days to make a determination of whether there is credible evidence of abuse or neglect or whether it's unfounded. And you can see that those numbers have been inching upwards as well. The top five counties in Illinois, of course, would be Cook County because it's the largest county. Unfortunately, where I work, Winnebago County, has pretty much ranked number two on that top list of both in, uh, investigations and indicated cases since I've been doing this in 2008 for years and years. Um, so it's not the ranking we want to be in Winnebago County, particularly when the county's child population only ranks seventh in the state. So Cook County and the five collar, collar counties that you see there, way more, way more children than we have, and yet we rank number two. And you can see the incidence rate per thousand um, being higher than most of the other counties in the state. What kind of economic cost is that? Um, you know, th there's no way to get a real handle on it. There are direct economic costs. There are indirect economic costs. Um, and if you look at the fallout from abuse and neglect, um, you know, it makes it very hard to put accurate numbers on there. Um, some of the numbers I have seen and I will share, um, nationally, it's been estimated it could be as much as $133 billion a year is what it costs us every single year for child abuse and neglect. Um, it's been estimated that 38 billion of those are direct costs. In other words, the amount of money it takes to raise children in foster care, pay those foster families, pay their medical bills, to provide counseling for those individuals um, and those members. Um, it's also the hospitalizations, if they are hospitalized, both mental health hospitalizations, and then potentially PEDS ICU, critical care hospitalizations. We had one group of four kids here, all involved a stay in the PEDS ICU, and the medical costs alone for the hospital, not counting physician uh, fees on top of that, was 895,000, and that was back in 2010. And then of course, law enforcement that has to be involved with this. If you look at the indirect costs, um, parents that may lose productivity, the children that down the road lose productivity because of injuries from child abuse, whether it's mental health, chronic physical health. Um, if we look at the amounts of special education required for those with uh, traumatic injuries, brain injuries. Um, and then if you add the criminal justice system, you know, we have judges that have to be paid and state's attorneys that have to be paid to prosecute these and then you have to house those individuals and provide care for those. Statewide, it's been estimated $3.8 billion a year. And the DCFS budget projected for this year is 1.3 billion. Last year in 2019, it was 1.2 billion. Um, that might be part of the problem in Illinois with our child abuse situation because of the fact that that 1.2 billion was also the budget in Illinois back in 2008 and 2009, 12 years ago. So the budget has not increased very much. There are expected budget increases over the next couple of years. But think of what we could do in the state with $3.8 billion if we didn't have to tackle a problem like child abuse. So what causes child abuse? What is it that we need to, to really focus on and, and to get a real grasp on to understand child abuse? Well, it's quite clear, and everybody probably knows this, I'm probably not giving anybody any information they aren't already aware of, but it's stress. And it's all kinds of stress that create child abuse. Um, I mean, if you had a perfectly happy baby in a perfectly happy family with unlimited resources and income, um, with great physical and mental health, 
it's not likely that anybody is ever going to get abused in that situation. Um, but we all are aware of the different things, the poverty, the lower socioeconomic status. Now, it's true that child abuse does not know any socioeconomic strata, that even people very wealthy can be physically abusive, they can be um, sexually abusive, they can be negligent as well. So um, stature doesn't, uh, economic stature doesn't uh, negate the, the, the risks for that. Certainly all levels of economic well-to-do can be involved with drugs and alcohol. That's not specific socioeconomic, although there are higher incidents in those groups because of self-medicating. The psychiatrists, psychologists out there that might be listening are well aware of all of these factors. But the big thing, domestic violence, we've seen that now, and that seems to be the buzzword um, throughout the country for the last couple of years, domestic violence. And there is no doubt that that is the underlying theme, which encompasses everything now. We're seeing mandated reporting laws for elder abuse, for spousal abuse, not only for children and the mandated reporting laws that have existed since 74. And domestic violence has become one of the big issues. Um, it's becoming much more recognized how that interaction occurs between violence in the household and its effects on all the people in the household. Um, and it's not just human beings, it's the animals as well. So now we've expanded our reporting domain so that if a law enforcement officer is called to a house for domestic violence report and parents are there in the midst of a domestic dispute and there are children present, they are required to notify DCFS because we know that if there's domestic violence, there's a significantly higher chance that there may be child abuse as well. It's also, if DCFS responds to a call on a child for possible child abuse and they notice that there are animals present in the home, they likewise are now required to let animal services know so they can talk, uh, conduct an animal welfare visit because we know that the abuse is carried about anything that's in the environment. Um, single parenting, without a doubt, we've seen an increase in single parenting. It was about five or six years ago here in Rockford that we had more children born to single mothers than out of married mothers. Um, and so the numbers are going up, but that creates a tremendous strain on that mother because of limited resources many of the time. They are a low, lower socioeconomic group. Um, one of the big things that is a underlying constant theme in child abuse, particularly when it comes to some of the more severe physical abuse and particularly abusive head trauma, is that entity called mom's boyfriend or the mother's boyfriend. Um, without a doubt, um, the mom's boyfriend, it seems like many times these people find single parents because they need a place to live, Often these moms are working or collecting checks from the state, so there's a source of income, and all they have to do is watch the kids. But unfortunately, they are not born babysitters. Many of them have their own desires like alcohol and drugs and don't want to be bothered, and we see tremendous amounts of neglect, but in particular, more serious physical abuse in those situations. And then, of course, the high-maintenance children. Uh, there's no doubt that children that are handicapped the autistic children, the autistic spectrum children, Down's kids, all of those are uh, inherent to their diseases and their disease process. It makes them much more difficult at times to discipline, to control, to be able to educate. Um, and so people without an understanding of why these children are doing things like that misinterpret that and feel that they are purposely being dis. Uh, disrespectful or disobeying, and so we see a lot of abuse. Um, economic hardship, definitely it's been shown in some studies that abuse and neglect decreases, unfortunately, when men go to work. Well, that's a good thing, but it also says that men staying home babysitting is not a good thing. But the converse, when women increase employment, the amount of abuse goes up, eight to 12% if there's a 1% increase in female employment. Um, a big study on the overall unemployment on child maltreatment, and this was from data collected around most of the U.S. counties, 
in the country, estimated that just a 1% point increase in unemployment rate may lead to as much as a 20% increase in neglect. 1% increase in unemployment. What have we had recently with COVID? Think of that number and what that would translate into. Um, you know, there's no doubt, as we talked about domestic violence, 95% of injurious domestic violence is committed by men against women. If you look at the children in those environments, in a couple studies, children whose mothers are battered, they are either physically abused or neglected at 15 times higher rate than the national average. And about half of the children of battered women are typically physically abused or even sex abused um, by the mom's uh, perpetrator as well. So the numbers are pretty staggering and, and, we, and we get it. Um, our police department here has really made pushes in the area of domestic violence and they're now trying to start a, um, what they call a family justice center. They're kind of taking off across the, the nation as a place to bring all sorts of domestic violence under one roof to provide the services necessary and the support necessary, whether it's emergency housing, uh, sh uh, shelter, things like that, food, whether it's daycare for the children, medical evaluations. Because what we have seen, and they did a study here in Winnebago County, that there, many of our adolescent perpetrators, the 15 to 17 year olds, if you go back in their records, at the time they were two, three, five years of age, they were actually victims that would have been seen by us at times as exposure to domestic violence. And so they're coming in to have exams done to make Sure, we don't find any evidence of physical abuse. As they get older, we find out that when they're five, seven, ten years of age, they're actually victims of physical abuse. And now we see them in the 15 to 17, and if the police aren't arresting them, quite often they're sexual offenders of young children. And so that cycle is definitely one that perpetuates, and until we get a really grasp on, grasp on that, it's going to be an ongoing issue. So how do children come to attention? There's a variety of ways we get them, we see them because someone has witnessed abuse. That would be our teachers. They're often one of the, the biggest reporters uh, and one of the first ones to see evidence of abuse in our kids or to hear evidence of abuse. Um, sometimes there's a disclosure to someone who reports it. There are behavioral changes and I'll talk some about those because that's something that we can all look at and focus on um, that may give us a clue to whether there is abuse or not. Um, and of course, sometimes we've had one case where a perpetrator actually confessed uh, to sexual abuse because he didn't want to continue on that course of sexual abuse. Doesn't happen very often, but it has occurred. Um, so children that are abused, obviously that's traumatic. And, and many, many people that study trauma in children, psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, this is, no secret to them, um, wasn't exactly what I was trained for, but you have to learn some of that. But definitely we will see all kinds of short-term effects with those kids. And it can be internalizing features that are coming out, or it can be externalizing features. And these are the things you have to watch for. If a child feels unsafe at home, if a child is next to a perpetrator and is very worried, or they're worried about going to the perpetrator's house during um, visitation, uh, those kind of things, they may develop anxiety, they may get very anxious, they may develop some decreased self-confidence, some fears, some phobias, they may become depressed over time. All these internalizing features that we have to be aware of and we have to be watching for. On the other hand, some children don't necessarily internalize and they become uh, externalizing behaviors. They throw more tantrums. They begin to become aggressive with animals, with other uh, playmates and children of their own age. They become disrespectful to adults, parents, teachers. They may be self-injurious. We start to see cutting develop. Um, we start to see all kinds of somatic complaints. So all of these types of things are definitely things to, to be on the lookout for. Um, sexualized behavior, over-sexualized behavior. There is a norm for children to be exploring. All children, two, three, four, go through certain stages of sexual exploration that is age appropriate. And so so it's when children exceed those bounds of what would be age appropriate that you have to be very concerned about the possibility of child sexual abuse. And in fact, that's one of the most um, strongest indicators uh, specific to child sexual abuse. 
So if you're seeing kids that are throwing more temper tantrums, becoming aggressive when they weren't before, sleeping in nightmares, children don't sleep well when they're under stress. People don't sleep well if there's a perpetrator in the household. You may see appetite disturbances. It's true with little kids, they develop eating problems. Big people, oftentimes adolescents will develop um, binging or bulimia or other feeding disorders or eating disorders. Uh, I said the excessive fears and phobias. Um, so all of these things need to be looked for. There can be changes in their, in their health conditions. Um, you can see all kinds of problems related to that. Oops, wrong side. Um, school problems, substance abuse, suicidal ideation, all of these things are things that you have to be on guard for. Now, the list I just gave you um, certainly is not a specific list for sexual abuse or physical abuse. Um, if a child um, perceives that their environment is unhappy, maybe parents argue there's no domestic violence, there's no physical, and the parents are loving parents, but the children are just subjected to a lot of screaming and shouting. Some children adapt well to that. Others may develop problems or issues. And so none of those, it could be bullying at school. It could be bullying in the neighborhood. Um, and so it's not necessarily an abusive type situation, although bullying is a type of abuse, but not by an adult. Um, so the, the goal is to stay cognizant of these changes and then to try to figure out what might be going on with that child. Physical complaints. So if you see a lot of kids that sometimes getting stomach aches, um, a lot of daytime incontinence, having accidents when they don't have them, headaches, chronic fatigue, um, chronic persistent abdominal pain, loss of energy, decreased activity. Those are some of the most common somatic complaints that we see. And of course, part of the problem we're seeing now is with COVID, there is this quote, COVID fatigue. People are probably aware, and I've had numerous patients in my office where the parents were saying that the child is really tired all the time now. And uh, they're worried about he might have COVID. They want a test done because he's chronically fatigued. Now, with teenagers, a lot of that is inactivity that's going on because they're not out and about, and they aren't, aren't out skateboarding at the public parks and stuff. Um, but that chronic fatigue could also be an underlying or a sign or a symptom of underlying abuse. Um, so what about COVID and um, how it affects where we've been? There's no doubt that, as I mentioned, teachers, the, the Grade school, middle school, high school teachers are responsible for 20% and above, 25% of all the reports by mandated reporters. It is the largest group that reports to an Illinois CFS. Um, and so we've lost that. We don't have our teachers uh, watching these students anymore. Now, they're back in schools. There's some hybrids. There's some remote learning. There's some all home or e-learning. And I can tell you as a general pediatrician, that has been a mess in the Rockford area. I don't know what it's like in the rest of the state or the country. Um, and then you add on top of the teachers, the preschool and the licensed daycares, which are our next largest groups of reporters. So we have essentially eliminated those. What kind of an impact has that had when we had months there, three to six months where our children were not being watched? If you look at April 9, as of April 9, 2020, it was estimated a UNESCO study worldwide that 90% of all our learners enrolled in pre-primary, primary, all the way up through secondary education were affected by school closures. 90% of the kids we lost sight of. Without a doubt, younger children be, uh, um, are substantially require more attention. They require more supervision. And so if they're not in a place where there's constant supervision, they're now back in the household where a parent may have more kids to watch, may have to try to conduct online education while they're watching younger preschool children. Um, some of those children may not be observed very well at all. Um, in our youngest children, if you look at physical abuse statistics, child abuse statistics, um, children in the first year of life have the highest death rates and the highest Physical abuse rates are in the first three years of life. So before they hit their fourth birthday is where 75%, almost 80% of all um, child deaths occur, as well as most of the physical abuse. That's our vulnerable population. 
It's also the kids that require a lot of attention, constant supervision. Um, and now they're all thrown into that home mix. Many times that home mix is also um, exacerbated by the fact that um, the mom might be trying to work or might be trying to work from home, which again reduces the amount of time that she has to supervise these kids. We talked about males being the perpetrators of abuse. And there's no doubt that we have now thrown our kids into that situation where males are uh, spending more time with these potential victims, or they're actually being the ones that are responsible for their wealth, uh, their care and, and well-being. Um, many minors are now being quarantined at home with their abuser. Um, and more importantly, those kids that are also cut off from one of their major safety nets, the ability to talk to a teacher or a counselor at school, um, a coach that's, teach, that's coaching their soccer team, um, their friends, they're at their friend's house and they tell something to their friend's parent. Um, these have all been now removed from these children's uh, source of defenses. If we look at Illinois specifically in, in terms of reports that occurred, in the first three weeks of March due to the COVID lockdown, the state received 50% fewer hotline calls, dramatic decrease in the number of hotline calls. Um, most of us feel that that does, does not mean that there was 50% reduced child abuse, and in fact, more than likely, represents an increase in the amount of abuse. Over the first three months, there were anywhere between 25 and 42% fewer calls to the uh, state hotline. If you look across the country, in the initial stages. Many states reported double digit percentages of decreased reports to child mandated reporting. Study done nationwide, 43 states in Virginia, uh, the district of DC reported that uh, the, the reports of neglect and abuse in April alone dropped 40%. Um, and it, it's not just the reports to DCFS. Pediatricians in the country at the same time during those first two months of lockdown noted that we were seeing, when we did see abuse, we were seeing a lot more severe injuries. And that's because if it's a minor injury, the parents don't bring them to us anyway. And it's only in response to a more severe injury where they feel that the child has to be seen um, that we start to see that. A delay in seeking medical care is very common uh, underlying theme as a, as a red flag for child abuse. Um, it's only when they feel that the child's life might be at stake or there's another severe aspect presenting like seizures, they stop breathing, a burn that looks severely infected that they often bring the child in. And of course, um, so the ones that are presenting to us acutely are typically ones that are more seriously injured. That was seen across the United States in reports uh, by pediatricians. It was seen in England as well. It was seen across the, the world, actually. Um, I found a study that between in the one month between March and April in this year, um, when England was shut down, the United King, Kingdom in uh, Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London, 10 children were treated for abusive head trauma. They had evidence of skull fractures or bleeding inside the brain. 10 children in that one month period, when over the prior three years, their monthly average is less than one, less than one. Um, Pennsylvania was reporting the same type of a situation. There's a couple reports I talked to uh, child abuse physicians at Comer Children's, Jill Glick um, and Norrell Rosado at Lori's, and their numbers were up as well in terms of ICU admissions for abdominal trauma, blunt abdominal trauma, and injuries to liver and pancreas. Um, if we look at what's going on in the sexual abuse reporting, in the area of sexual abuse, the Rape and Abuse and Incest National Network, RAIN, for the first time in 25-year history, said that half of the victims they called requesting or receiving help from the National Sexual Hotline um, uh, were, were um, minors. For the first time, minors calling to try to get out of an abusive situation themselves. The National Sexual Assault Hotline said that of the COVID-related calls or concerns that the adolescents had, 67% identified their perpetrator as a family member, and in almost 80% of those, they were actually living with that alleged perpetrator. So how do we mitigate these problems? What can we do when we don't have children in the classroom, when they're not in daycare, 
when they're not in the preschools. Um, it makes it very, very difficult. As you can see, it'd be hard for you to see if I had many arm bruises on my arms. You're not really seeing my arms. If I bring them up, it's different. But how do we manage this? There are some online websites that you can look at that talk about things that might be done in the COVID world. Um, earlier detection to favor a more quick intervention and response. Um, so how do, you, how do you get the teachers to, to begin to pick up on these symptoms? It's a very difficult job to do. It requires uh, not just teaching what they're trying to teach, but they've got to scrutinize. If you think if you've got a class of 15 and you're looking at 15 different pictures on a screen or highlighting one or two of them, um, obviously we can try to support parents better in this stress-related world. Um, studies have shown that where home nursing visits occur to young families and single parents, um, actually throughout pregnancy, but also after delivery for those first couple of months where babies are the fustiest and the stresses are the highest, that has been shown to reduce the incidence of child abuse significantly. Maybe what we need to do is if we don't have a lot of kids in school is to utilize homeschool nurses to make house calls on the most uh, potentially vulnerable, the kids that we think might have the highest risk based on other factors that we're aware of in the school setting. Um, maybe if a teacher notices that someone seems to be constantly late or their camera is off a lot of the time, or the parent is always in the background monitoring the child. That might be a very astute parent that's trying to help the child learn and teach and just wants to make sure she's learning what the child is learning to help out. It might be a parent that doesn't want that child to state anything uh, across the, the internet. Um, maybe financial support. Obviously, we know that, that poverty has a big impact and that's a big problem for many, many households today. Um, so it's difficult. We gotta kind of retrain our teachers and make sure they're equipped to do this job since they are the number one uh, reporter for all abuse. Are there ways that they can identify that? What way can they spot, spot signs and symptoms of abuse? Um, and especially if they're doing it from a distance learning model. Um, maybe we need to institute specific languages protocols. Maybe there's opportunities to um, have buzzwords or um, kind of like the, the 911 signals on tablets. So if a child is having issues at home, can press that button so the teachers know. And maybe this is something that needs to be done at the beginning of all home instruction so that children know they have an opportunity and a way out. Um, so for the rest of us, what can we do as parents? Or, and not just in times of COVID, but certainly at this time, what can you do? And of course, once I'm sure that this is not the new norm forever, once this resolves, what can we do long term? I'm telling you, because of the internet access, you got to monitor children closely online. Children have enough problems online already. There's too much sexting. There's too many pictures being transmitted by junior high and high school kids. Parents have to be on top of their children's internet usage, their phone usage. I tell all the kids in my practice when I see them that if the parent ever picks up a phone or their computer and it's locked and they don't have the password, the child's lost it for two weeks period. No questions asked. It's never, never password protected against a parent. You gotta watch your, fam your, your, your friends, your kids' friends. You've gotta see if it looks like they're showing signs of stress, depression, anxiety. Um, those kind of things. You might do that when your kids are FaceTiming or you might set up Zoom time where they can talk or have their little Zoom parties, but kind of keep an eye on what's been going, what's going on. And don't ever hesitate to ask questions. You know, without a doubt, there was a resident one time, a psychiatry resident in doing a pediatric rotation who had about a 28% higher rate of child abuse reports than any other resident going through pediatrics. When they asked her about that, why are you finding all this child abuse when our pediatric residents are, are not seeing this? What are you doing that's different? And she just made one simple statement. I asked them, I asked the patients, I asked the students, I asked the kids, you know, if they feel safe, if they feel like they're being harmed, are they being bullied? Don't be silent, ask questions. 
I think with that, we'll finish. Any questions? Well, Dr. Davis, thank you so much for sharing that information with us. Um, one question is, how do you continue to stay passionate about this work that can be very heavy and sometimes heartful, heartfelt? So how do you stay passion infused about this? Um, well, can you hear me? Is my mic yes. on? Yeah. So it's, the hard ones are the hospital visits, the shaken babies, the abusive head trauma. There are some really, it can be difficult. So first of all, that's why I am still general pediatrics and not just child abuse pediatrics. Although covering 15 counties and a large volume, we need somebody out here full time. Um, I've just never felt that I could commit to that because I would might lose my sanity. Um, there, there are other things I, you know, I um, hate to say it. I mean, I like to run, I like to jog. Unfortunately, it comes 11, 12 o'clock at night till one or two in the morning, but it's a good stress reliever for me. I still like to stay physically active. Um, but even there, the, the, although there are a lot of times I have gone home and sat on the front porch, grabbed a beer and wept a little bit because of things that went on. There are many times, and, and if Lisa and Dave Lawrence are watching this, there are many times they can attest to that um, many, many, many of our kids leave with a big smile on their face. They have had validation of their complaints. They, have, they feel like they've been vindicated. Somebody believes them and trusts them. They understand more about um, their own ability to protect themselves and they've also had a personal experience where they realized um, that, that it's not always a terrible situation. Um, our exams generally are, not, are definitely not painful. And um, if you can take, why we spend an hour and a half with most of the patients to two hours, because you can spend a lot of time developing rapport. And so when they walk away smiling, when they turn around, run back, and they want to give you a hug after you've just completed an exam and photographed 30 different owies all over their body. It's a real gratifying situation. It, it really is. Yeah. And um, because of time, uh, one last question. How do you feel Illinois Wesleyan prepared you for your next degrees as well as your professional career? So, you know, without a doubt, as I said in my acceptance speech, um, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Wesleyan. Um, first of all, the, the science training I had in all three sciences, um, you know, basically in the old days of medic, medical training, it was first and second year were pretty much the basic sciences, which was pretty much a cakewalk for me because it was just about nothing new. I, I literally had the ability to, you know, the histology, the biochemistry, all of it was pretty much just a refresher. So you know, that was wonderful. And, and uh, because of those intense studies that set me up beautifully for medical school. But like I said, you know, I, I had a real crisis situation sophomore year. Um, many people can remember my sophomore year as not being one of my most um, illustrious years at, at Wesleyan. Um, and a lot of it had to do with the, the realization that medicine is like any other business or industry and there are good people and bad people and if it wasn't for Gary Kessler who sat down and said but you know you're making a snap decision your love has been that way you don't know what it's going to be like so why don't you try it and even when I called him back after sophomore year during my sophomore year he said do you know what it's like to be a pediatrician have you been in your clinicals have you taken care of kids and he said I'd call me back in a year if you felt the same way. And I called him back to say thank you, but I didn't meet his letter of recommendation. So literally would not be here if it wasn't for Wesleyan. Well, thank you for that. And again, thank you for your presentation and congratulations on being this year's recipient of the Distinguished Alumni Award.
and we appreciate you sharing your story with us today. Uh, thank, thank you very to, much. Of course. And thanks to all of you for engaging in this discussion. As I said, this presentation and all of our videos from this week will be available on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Illinois Wesleyan University Alumni Association. Once you've found it, be sure to subscribe so that you can get notices of new releases of videos from this week as well as in the future. The homecoming festivities continue tomorrow at noon central time. We'll have another back to college class featuring this year's Young Alumni Award winner, Sarah Gadiri, presenting Beyond the Border, the law for asylum seekers. We hope to see you then, but certainly later in the week. Everyone stay safe and well. Have a good evening. Thanks.